Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast, conversations with today's top ministry leaders to help you lead better every day. And now podcasting from scenic Colorado Springs, Colorado, here's your host, Jason Day. Welcome, friends. I have a lively conversation for you this week on the Church Leaders Podcast. I got to chat not with just one, but with two great men of God, Justin McRoberts and Scott Erickson. Justin is a pastor in the San Francisco Bay Area. He's also a songwriter and a retreat leader. Scott is a teaching pastor in Portland, and he's a performance artist, a touring painter, and a storyteller. Together, they have released a new book entitled Prayer, 40 Days of Practice, which is not uh, really a how-to book. Rather, it's an invitation to intimacy with God. Now, on this week's episode, Scott, Justin, and I talk about why we often compartmentalize our lives, why spiritual disciplines are vital for us as pastors and ministry leaders, and then we touch on the power of creative expression and communicating the good news of Jesus. Such a great conversation with two great guys, so please won't you join me in my conversation with Scott Erickson and Justin McRoberts. Justin and Scott, welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast. So great to have you with us. Thanks for having us, man. Yeah, glad to be here. Awesome. Now, we're going to talk about spiritual formation some today, both from from a personal sp- perspective as yeah. pastors, as ministry leaders, but also because both of you guys are involved in, in ministry as, as pastors and uh, teaching pastors and those types of things. I, I want right. to talk about how we can invite our people um, to experience and engage in meaningful spiritual practices. As sort of a launching point for our conversation, I'd like to begin with a story uh, that you guys share in your book, Prayer, 40 Days of Practice. Okay. And you have a reading in there with an intriguing title. It's Spiritual Antacids. And you touch <laughs> right. on this. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. You touch on this tendency that we have to classify some things in our lives as spiritual and other things as maybe unspiritual or secular. Can you talk to us a little bit about through that, uh, you know, kind of sure. that, that classification and, and, and what that means for us? Yeah, I actually just reposted, I just posted a, a kind of retelling of the story at uh, IGTV on uh, the Instagram. So if someone wants to pop over and hear the whole thing kind of fleshed out, you, you can do that over there. I mean, the long story made short, this pastor person comes and sits with, a, with, with another pastor friend or with a spiritual director and complains about this pain in his chest and the priest hands him a, or, you know, the spiritual director of his hands him an antacid and he says, you know, you don't have a spiritual, you don't have what you think is a spiritual problem. You're not having a, like a bad conversation with God. You have heartburn. <laughs> and when, what I do with the, with the conversation, there's the, like, the, I think that's a spiritual thing as well. And part of what I would say keeps us to, to push in the direction of your question, part of what keeps us has kept me from having like long-term healthy ongoing conversations about spiritual practice is we tend to narrow down what spiritual practice is um, into this this realm of things that that isn't physical it isn't financial it isn't sexual it uh, it isn't emotional it isn't mental it isn't mm. medical so you can't admit it's, so it's not about the medicine you're taking it's not about whether the fact you're 45 pounds overweight it's not about the fact that you and your wife are fighting it's this other thing that we can't really get our brains around when in actuality i think spiritually is to see my entire life Mm. From from my money to my sex life to my marriage to my to, you know like broader marriage to like emotional conversations with sisters and brothers to the way I take in news as things that take take place in the context of of a divinely inspired and woven together existence that there isn't a, that there the way uh, Abraham Kuyper says it is that there's not one square inch in all the human experience over which Christ who is sovereign does not cry mine. To think mm. that way mm. is to think spiritually, so that whatever conversation I'm having, we can actually we can practice that in a way that binds together the way I'm living with the will of God. Um, why <laughs> why do you think we have a tendency to compartmentalize things? I'm going to pitch this to Scott here in a second. Like for me personally, um, I think there are it's a compartmentalization always personally comes when I it's it's a way to not face things. Like I don't think it's a I don't think the philosophic it's a, it's a theological problem uh, fundamentally for me. I tend to sector things off if there are things that I don't really want to deal with because it makes it easier to not deal with them. I'd like to be able to put things in boxes and put those boxes in boxes and put those boxes on shelves and file them away in a closet somewhere. 
where in actuality, I feel like the way my life really works is like it's all everything's kind of tangled up together in one room, and I can't pull on this thread without that thing way over there moving. Um, so I tend to compartmentalize because there's stuff in my life in my in the way of my life that I don't want to face. I think it's a defense mechanism. Does that resonate with you, Scott, or do you mm-hmm. have a different take there? Well, I mean, I think we're always creating categories and where things fit in, um, for sure. I think, I think too, we've also been formed by spaces that have been created. And uh, as we grow up, we, we, as we grow up and we're learning how to survive in the world, you know, we have other adults go, no, 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 we don't talk about that here. Or, no, 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 this isn't the place for that. Yeah. I, I actually yeah. I, I actually think that because um, what, <laughs> what life is, is it's sacred moments and fart jokes. Um, <laughs> and But you can't go to a comedy club and get too sacred because they're like, no, 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 that's not the place for this. That's not the place for this here. And you can't go to a church service and get too crass because they're like, no, no, that's not the place for this here. So we actually have these kind of segmented places that we go, well, this is kind of where we talk about these things here. And then we have this other place where it's like, this is where we talk about these things over here, when actuality, what real life is, is, is all of those things at the same time. And so we, it's, it's, I, I, think, I think there are emerging and maybe places where that happens. I think, you know, like AA meetings or any kind of recovery program, I think there's some really interesting work in uh, storytelling platforms like The mm-hmm. Moth or Snap Judgment, um, This American Life, that, that actually navigates both of those, yeah. uh, pretty honestly. Um, and I, I actually think, I had this conversation uh, with, with the people I help r- work at a church with, um, where, not that we need to start instigating like fart jokes during the service, but it's like, well, <laughs> what, how... Are we being honest? I, I, I wonder if a lot of people like leaving church because they're actually understanding that that's their life and they're like, this doesn't make sense anymore because it's not it's not ever speaking to all these other things about my life. And I and I and so I just I just don't know if God is in any of these aspects of my life. Mm, that's um, good. So I, I wonder. So I think, yeah, I definitely think there's what Justin's saying is uh, true. And I think there's also another component of just kind of what we learn from others before us. And culturally, I understand that, you know, like I remember <laughs> my, even, even like Uno <laughs> or something like that, or playing the game, uh, talking about the game yeah, Uno? Like, like my grandparents, when my grandparents came over, like we couldn't have playing cards out, you know, like cause my, and my dad was like, and my, they're like, Oh, they're not okay with that. And <laughs> I was like, but you are like, what? I don't know. I like, as a kid, I just was like, I, what is the, I don't understand what's going on here. I just knew how to, res- I just knew how to act to survive. Interesting. And keep peace. Yeah. And so I, I think there's all these kind of dynamics that are at, at play in those kind of conversations. Yeah. So, you know, you're saying like you were sort of trained to, to like work around a thing as opposed to the, to discern. Yeah. I and I that. think that when, and, and especially, I know we're kind of spiritual formation. We'll talk about prayer, but uh, I just, what, what Justin and I have been speaking on is going, uh, you need to bring like one of the, one of the reasons you give up kind of praying while you stop praying as you get older is because yeah, you don't good. actually feel like you can be yourself that's right. in all of that. Mm. Um, you actually, you actually think like, these are the ways that I, these are the ways that I have to pray. Um, yeah, man. we have this family member and whenever we're at our, his house for a meal, He'll pray before the meal. And he's like a contractor. <laughs> he's like a man's man. You know what I'm talking about? Like right. utility belt, hammer. <laughs> at dinner. Of- at the dinner table. Utility belt. At dinner. Dinner table. Yeah. Hammer huge, rattling around. Huge mustache. Makes Tom Selleck jealous. And he, uh, he'll be like, he'll pray. And all of a sudden, he takes on this like lispy, childlike voice. And he'll be like, dear Jesus, do you think <laughs> for this day? And we're like, who's this guy? Who's this guy? And I think <laughs> what's happening is he's like, what he's learned is like the person I need to be to talk to God is not the person who I am. Man, that's so strong. Wow. And that, and that is like, that has, that, that goes in all different kinds of aspects in our spiritual life. Yeah, I want to tag on one more sure, thing here, go ahead. Be, because like, the, I mean this, the, the, you've, you cracked one open here for us. The, 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 the whole idea of like being who you are 
and then feeling like you have to be someone else in relationship to God is like, it, it's not like not yet. Yeah, everyone faces that. I wonder if, I mean, as a pastor, I feel that in a particular way. And I wonder if part of why this, the, you know, spiritual practice and spiritual discipline is, is a struggle is like, maybe that's a little bit deeper rooted for pastors that, that the idea that you've got to be in some sort of performance oriented way, someone you aren't completely in order to do your job sometimes, or in order to, to like perform as a pastor that ends up being a little bit of a personality split there. So I don't always feel like I can bring, and this is from personal history. I don't always feel like I can bring the whole of me to God. Cause I don't really bring the whole of me almost anywhere. Uh, because I have to, because if I'm in a room full of people, I can't just be the friend. I've got to also be the pastor and that comes with expectations that other people are putting on me, uh, that I, whether I want them or not, et cetera. I think that's a significant part of it as well. Is like, is what Scott's bringing to the table with you don't really feel as a pastor, like there are all that many spaces where you get to be a whole person and, mm. Uh, mm. And so maybe that actually has some like some deep resonance in the way I actually relate with God. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. No, that's good. And and I, I think that's true because oftentimes even if we want to just hang out as pastors, if we want to just hang out with some friends, you know, um, oftentimes our friends who view us as, you know, especially if we're their pastor, right? So they're friends within yeah, our congregations, right? We just want to hang out with them. They, they still have that perspective that, you know, we're the pastor. So, you know, they kind of, you know, we want to hang out and just have a good evening. And, you know, but they're bringing some of these other things and nothing against that, you know, because we yeah. are that role in their life. But sometimes yeah. for us, we just want to we just want to yeah. hang and not not yeah. necessarily be, you know, counseling or walking through something necessary yeah, with someone. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's I mean, and that comes with the territory. Like, that's a thing. You know, and I kind of knew it's what I was signing up for when I when right. I planted the church. I was young enough when I was planting the church. There was all kinds of <laughs> all kinds of stuff. I had no idea, but you know, during you know during oh, training detail. with the evangelical, <laughs> yeah, but you know, during training with the evangelical Covenant church, part of what they went into was, you know, here's because I would tell these stories, and 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 my teacher said, you know, part of what you're running into is this thing called a power differential, that you don't so long as you are a pastor. And even for years after you decide you're not going to be a pastor, you don't just you just don't get that. You don't get to just be another person in the room. That is a thing you sacrifice right. if you call yourself a pastor. If you call yourself a spiritual mm -hmm. leader, it's like being a therapist. It's like when you're a therapist. I see, like, I'll see my my therapist retired a couple months ago, like a few months ago, and like I'll run into her social spaces, and there's like this whole navigation of like. What can, where do we go here with this relationship and how do we talk and can I get you a soda? Like, but with a pastor, it's really similar. Like, you don't get to be just one of the guys or one of the gals. You don't get to just to be one among if you're a pastor. It's a thing you actually give up. And I, I never really got the training, but through failure, uh, how, like, it, with regards to like how to actually navigate that interpersonally. And now that I think about it, I'm positive that had. I'm not going to say adverse effects, but it definitely impacted the way I saw myself in relationship to God, that like there were elements of my life, ways in which like I practiced who I was that I didn't really know how to talk about openly, even mm. with God, because I don't talk about those things openly with anybody because I'm a pastor. Yeah. Yeah. C can I, uh, I do think though, in my vocation, you know, if I had, uh, I guess like a spiritual temperament. I'm probably more of a prophetic voice than a pastoral voice, but I do think at having worked in a number of churches and seeing seeing the inner conversations between leaders, yeah. uh, and maybe it, maybe this is my pitch that every pastor should find a spiritual director. Like mm -hmm. we, if you've been in if you've been on a journey of faith long enough, you know that doubt and faith are dance partners. They're not, they're not opposing opposites. And I think, we, uh, I think a better way of viewing faith is seasonal and like, Hey, you're going to have winter months. You're going to have winter months where it looks like everything's dead, but yet still things are working underneath hidden and the, a spring will come, but it's part of the formation. Right. Yeah. And I, 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 but I understand that you can't get up on Sunday and go, Hey, this week I didn't believe any of this. Um, <laughs> because, there's jobs at stake and mortgages to pay and and that kind of whole thing. Um, I do think, though, if you don't have a place to be poor in spirit, yeah, man. that that eventually leads to some other kind of 
outlet of self sabotage mm. of um, of 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 medicating through right. you know substances sites people um, and and we've all seen that in the news and know other people so I I definitely think like this isn't a really important conversation that I I. There's a part of me, personality wise, what Justin says. I'm like, you can't tell me who I am. And I'm an Enneagram <laughs> four, so I've got to be authentic at all times, right? <laughs> um, but I do think you're right, Justin. Um, uh, but, and my appendix to what you're saying is like, but you need a place where you can do that. Yes, sir. Because yep, you, no, yeah. you will not make it. You yeah. will not make it. You will not make it. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I think that's good. I, th- I think that's good, Scott, because. Um, for sure, it's it's one of those things where we do have to have that that outlet because we're on a spiritual journey as well. And I think that's a, that's one of the things that we struggle with as pastors and ministry leaders is we always feel like we're leading in some way, and yet we're always following, right? So uh, we we have to be conscious of the fact that we are following, we are learning, we are growing, yes. we're stretching, we're failing, we're doubting, we're you know we're we're going through all those as well because we're on the same journey and and. To be honest, God doesn't want us to miss out on that journey. He doesn't want us to gloss right. over that and yeah. and put on you know a happy face all the time because somehow we've been called to lead a ministry. So there's got to be a yeah. balance for both. I, and I think that's uh, in many ways that's where kind of spiritual formation, spiritual disciplines help us be open to that because we we have those opportunities to really be honest um, yeah. with God. So let, let's dive in a little bit about spiritual disciplines from a pastoral perspective, from from the perspective of a ministry leader. Talk to us a little bit about what you guys have experienced that has been helpful and effective in your journey as as ministers. Oh, man. Um, yeah. <laughs> you want to go first, Justin? Uh, sure. It's, Sabbath keeping has been the, the primary uh, life-giving practice for me to good. actually like put it on the calendar and to make it regular. Uh, to make it weekly, um, to just uncompromisingly try and to uh, try to practice the Sabbath. Uh, and to ask, there's a great book. Um, there are several great books. My my favorite kind of take first to third step into the practice of Sabbath is Mark Buchanan's The Rest of God, Restoring Your Soul by Restoring Your Sabbath. Canadian author, pastor. And the question he asks uh, as a, as a, you know, how do you do Sabbath? mantra is um you know he says you know uh no the sabbath mantra is embrace that which gives life cease from what is necessary and then do whatever you want and what it and that what that did as a sabbath practice as a sabbath question for me as a spiritual discipline was help me to draw a line between the things i did that i did take joy in but that i was also really actually obliged to there, there were lots of relationships that like i really actually find joy in these relationships but i am also, also obliged to them and it uh-huh. helped me to say no like cuz i can take a great deal of joy in my life but i think the three of us will probably all confess to like the most burned out folks we know are people who love what they do yeah. Because you just never stop. Right, right. And then eventually you begin to resent the thing that you love because it's stealing life from you. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's mm-hmm. ugly. So learning to like learning to ask that question, like where where is there – what are the things in my life that are simply life-giving that I'm not simply obliged to so that I can practice those things and so that I can have a healthy relationship with the other things, again, where I do take joy. Right, right. I love – I'm, I'm, I'm a, like, like I'm with Scott. I'm a four – I'm outgoing. I love people, but at some point, like, I, like I need to draw a line and understand, like, I am also obliged to see these relationships, and if I don't show up, like, the, you know, there would be problems. And I'm really ultimately showing up because I have to. To be able to be honest with myself about that, that's the thing that Sabbath did for me. So Sabbath practice and asking that question: Can I? What? What? What can I embrace that gives life? What am I? What are the things in my life I'm actually obliged to to set me free to then? like step into a Sabbath practice and do the things that are in my heart. That's, that's good. Justin, real quickly, you uh, what are those three things again? And, uh, cease from what is necessary. Okay. So you make a list of like, like all the things you do in your life that you're just, you're flat out obliged to. It's your right. job. It's in some cases, sorry, this is gonna sound awful. It's your fatherhood, uh, or your motherhood. Yep. It's, it's your marriage. Um, it's, uh, you know, anything you're obliged to that if you don't do, there'd be repercussions. And then the second list is that which gives life, the things that are just simply life giving 
and joyous and fr- and that like you can go choose them, but there's no replication to not do it. And then the last one is once you've actually done that work, then like to figure out what you can to, to go and make a list of like what stuff you want to do. Cease from what is necessary, embrace that which gives life, and then do whatever you want. So that the, the freedom of choosing to live well and to live healthily comes from a place of knowing the difference between the two as opposed to just feeling it out in the dark. That's good. That's good. Awesome. Mm. What about you, Scott? Um, I, so I'm, uh, training as a spiritual director and, and all the kind of aspects of spiritual discipline and stuff. And I was having this conversation, uh, I was speaking at a church in Indiana and I was talking to one of the pastors there and he, he said, he's very extroverted like me. And he's like, man, I just, I feel like spiritual retreats have been taken over by introverts. Like they're always wanting to like <laughs> go somewhere and then like not talk all day. And he's like, I find that there's like a lot of like what helps me is being able to be with people and talk to people and all this stuff. And, and I was listening to him and I was like, I, I think that's so funny. And I agree in a lot of ways. And I said, you know, and I was like, I, I was like, I'm not judging you because I'm the same way. And we're all the same way as like there, there is a place that you're hiding there is a place in you that you hide from others, and um, and we all have that place. And what silence and solitude allows us to do is to 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 really have to look at that place, because that's the place that God wants to heal us. Mm-hmm. And it's usually the place of shame, whatever that shame is. Mm-hmm. And so um, I like right now I'm on a I'm on a I just have a lot of uh, I have this show I'm doing and touring. And so I'll be on the road for a few days and I come home and I'm like demolished <laughs> and like, like physically just tired uh, and then, and just drained. And I, I think probably the practice that's been really helpful for me is really paying attention to my body. I mean, I, I'm come from Scandinavian background and I get the, Danish theologian all in our head. But I think what's really helpful for me of late has been to pay attention and and really recoup through uh, my body. So like I go sit in my friend's hot tub, I go on walks, I stretch, I go swim laps, uh, I rest, I take a nap, you know, right. and, and a lot of that is in, and then, you know, I have small children. So a lot of times when I come home, I have to take care of the kids all day which are not my favorite dad moments, but, uh, it, it is like, there's like, cause when you're, uh, when you're actually like when you're preaching or if you do like a lot of services, your, your body is pumping adrenaline to do all that. And so you will have that low, right. Uh, the next few days as your body's like readjusting. And so we, we our spiritual practices must be involved uh, in our in actual incarnation, which is it, which is this biological masterpiece we're in, that gets tired, that needs good food, <laughs> that needs a hug, yeah. that needs to take a nap. So I think uh, a lot of the practices that have been, you know, and I'm using prayer practices in silence, solitude, generosity, you know, these all these kinds of Sabbath. But then also seeing it in a scope is like this can't just be in my head. This has to this has to be embodied in a way, um, and so that's that's probably been the most transformational for me. That's good. That's good. You know what's interesting in both of your responses? I think one of the big things as as pastors and ministry leaders that we have to get through is giving ourselves permission to unwind into Sabbath and to take care of ourselves physically. You know, I mean, as you, yeah. as you're both talking, I was thinking like. That's one that I know the hardest things for me is, and oftentimes I think those of us who are in ministry leadership, you know, we tend to operate with with just a natural sense of urgency, right? Because Mm -hmm. we're in on this, you know, big mission of God, right? You know what I mean? So in our minds, we just have this natural sense of urgency because, you know, um, we're talking about some eternal implications here, right? So just there's that kind of within us. And so we almost have to come when it comes to these spiritual disciplines that feed us, we almost have to come to a point where we give ourselves permission and we're okay with slowing down. We're okay with doing something 
um, that feeds us, you know what yeah. I mean, or something that we just want to do. And that's not a bad thing, right? No, and, and, and actually it might be helpful, and it's not a com- it's not all of the thought, um, but it really might be helpful to think of it as a way of leading. In other words, that you don't lead and then stop leading. Like if you are called uh, – if you're called by God to be a pastor, if you're called by God vocationally to lead, then that's simply it's in you. It's a call. It's on your life, your whole life. Right. And so how you rest is part of how you lead. How you step away is part of what you communicate to your congregation. So one of the things I'll counsel pastors or other folks when they're trying to step away and try to like, what, what happens if someone calls? What happens if someone asks me for the time that I've set aside? I'm like, well, what a, what a witness it is to the gospel to say – Jesus is more important to me than you are. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, whoa. Like, do we, because, and let's, if we can be honest for a second, like a lot of, a lot of what happens in these pastoral relationships is that like my job and what I do for you in the name of Jesus ends up seeming more important, but that becomes a kind of idol. So to be able to communicate to a congregation, to, to a friend, to, you know, especially to that congregate who doesn't seem to have great boundaries. To be able to say, well, yeah, I no, I don't have anything on my calendar that day, but here's why. Like that's a day I've set aside for for God. This is a time I'm spending in in prayer. That's what I do during that time. And that's not a matter of selfishness. Like I'm trying to set a tone here for like God is more important than the people in your life. And if you don't get that right, then the people in your life get to suffer. So to bear witness as a leader in the way we step away. I mean, the way Paul says it, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. So he's like you were saying, like you're always following. So how do you set an example as a follower? Right, right. The part of what you do as a follower is you live like Christ and then communicate how you're living like Christ. And part of what you communicate as a leader is here are my weaknesses. You have them too. I can speak at your weaknesses or I can show you how I live into you and let Jesus minister to me in mine. Mm. That's good. Yeah, I think, you know, I'll share this story. I I don't know this man. My friend, there's going to be no names mentioned. <laughs> there is an there is an aging, famous evangelist who's still alive, but my friend got to sit with him and another really well known worship leader, and he was like, it was like sitting at this man's deathbed. He, though he's not, he's just old. He's, he's you know we don't know when he's going to pass, but he's like it was like listening to his regrets. Mm. And he was speaking his regrets to this other guy. And his three regrets were, I wish I uh, wouldn't have thought that God needed me to do so much. Mm. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. Yeah. That's rough, man. Uh, which I think, I've been thinking about this a lot. What is God, What do we believe about God's sovereignty? Mm. I mean, if we're... Like, I got to do all these things. I was talking to my spiritual director, who's m- mentioned in our book as in the thank yous. And he was like, Scott, every single pastor I meet with, every single one. And he meets with all the large, all the head pastors in Portland. Right. He meets most of them. And he's like, none of them have a prayer life. Mm-hmm. They're all busy doing things. They're like, I don't have any prayer life. What? I don't know. I feel like. I've been backstage at a lot of things and I was just like, what, what is it you're offering people? If not your own experience, right? Amen. What is the well you are drawing from? And I, I think we can just become so obsessed with like some kind of rubric of numbers or accomplishments and stuff. But I don't, I just, I'm like, I don't understand if I'm not living this myself, what am I even offering people Mm -hmm. to well, and, and to say that in a different way, to say like like you are what God has given these yes. people. Like you it's not the... your teaching, bro. It's not it's right, right. it's not your it's you're not God didn't give you wisdom to pass it on. No, God gave you to yeah. those people. He was like, Hey, here's a group of people in Portland and Concord and Martinez that yeah. I wanna love. I'm I'm gonna send Sarah. I'm yeah. going to send Stan. I'm going to send yeah. you. You're the work I'm doing. It's not yeah. the thing in you. Like you're totally. the work I'm doing. You're yeah. beloved. And I want you to know that you're beloved so you can pass on my belovedness of you as the work. That's the, th- that's literally the ball game. Yeah. I totally agree. I totally agree. The other, 
I think the other one of the other things he said that was really interesting he's like I wish I didn't run over so many people to accomplish what I thought I needed to accomplish and so he's actually been spending his last few however long he has uh going through his whole history of uh, bad relationships and calling them and contacting them and apologizing wow. and making amends. What? That's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing to me. Uh, but I, th- I, I think you know, just I, I really want to trust that Jesus knows what He's doing, and uh, He'll let me know wh- where I need to help, and then and be like, okay, you get a day off because I don't need you every single day. <laughs> I, I need you. To, I need you to be a flourishing person. Right. That's right. What I- that's what I need. That's interesting because we're so we live in such a performance based culture, right? In a you know highly highly you know production, like what are we producing? And and I think that's a challenge for us as as ministers is uh, we feel that pressure, and you know it's it's the culture in which we live, and 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 yet the the upside down culture of Christ, you know, there's a massive tension there. You know, it's it's not what we produce; it's what Christ is producing in us. And so, you know, when we talk about you know God has given us um, our presence to a congregation, you know, to a gathering of people. Um, yeah. For us, we we automatically just think, well, how are we performing and what are we producing, as opposed to presence, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good, guys. What a great conversation. Before we uh, head out, again, I want to talk a little bit about um, Prayer, 40 Days of Practice. Super cool book that you guys put together, and uh, much different than than any other book I've ever picked up on prayer. Um, very, very creative. You both are, are incredibly creative guys, Justin and Scott. You guys are storytellers, songwriters, performance artists, visual artists, and, and just uh, how, how it walks through these 40 days of practice, just the storytelling – the imagery, I mean, the artwork in here, just absolutely fantastic. Can you talk to us just a little bit before we take off about um, how does creativity, you know, play into how we communicate um, the good things of God? Well, a great function, uh, speaking, I mean, I think this happens in music and theater and poetry. I know with visual art, um, it's a really great question to go, what does this mean when you see a piece of work? Or like, what does this mean? You know, what's the right. context, the story? What was the artist getting at? But another function of art is, what is this pulling out of you? Mm. What is this exhuming out of you? Um, because we, we, all see, we all see how we see. We all see the world through our own perspective. Right. And so I, I, as a practitioner of paintings and, uh, and artwork, that, and, I, and I've done it, for years in churches during church services and stuff, people will come up and be like, what does this mean? And I'll be like, well, what do you think it means? And you know, everybody will have a different kind of response. Cause what it's, it, it's, what's it doing is it's pulling out. This is how it feels like in my own skin. This is, this is how the spirit started speaking to me about my life. And, and that's a, an amazing function. I think, uh, words can do that too, but often we're so familiar with words. We're like, I know what that means. And we don't really let Uh, it do that function. I know what this song means. Um, but, uh, those do those things. So Justin and I started from the premise that we were like, we're not going to make a book about we're we're not telling, we don't have any secrets of having a better prayer life because we're like, we don't know what the conversation in you is, Right. but we're going to make a, we're going to make uh we're going to make some excavation tools that help you get to that. And so, and we wanted to make it for 2019, you know, with the internet and phones and stuff. Uh, we wanted to make something that was simple, that was concise, that was like a, a well orchestrated scalpel that just helps you get to the the thing you need to get to. And so we use images and words Um, partly because those are, uh, how we, uh, communicate, but also we know that combining both of those causes a different neurological interaction with the the content and, and uses both sides of the brain in really interesting ways and in deep ways. Um, and so, uh, I think why, yeah. And I mean, we could do a really long podcast on, uh, what, what's, what's missing in Protestantism, but I think what we need to uh, a function of creativity is like is that it helps us get to that deeper that deeper truth yeah. that deeper song like it's uh you it's like when you when you're like if if you even still listen to the radio and you know a song comes on and you're like oh this is my song like what are you saying there you're saying sonically and lyrically 
this artist um, is 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 perfectly communicating what it feels like to be in my own skin or what I'd hope to be like in my own skin. Mm. And it's like deeply resonating with me. And that becomes like a vehicle yeah. to to get to an honest conversation with God. And that's so that that's that's what artwork is. That's what songs are. Um, that's what you know, we sing songs together, not because we need people to come out of the narthex into the sanctuary. We sing songs because singing exhumes that out of us. It connects us and, and those kinds of things. Same with poetry, okay. prayers, those kinds of things. So I think in a, in a way of creativity or, or creative work, creative expression, I think that's a function of spiritual formation that is in our midst. We, because of the Reformation and kind of, you know, this kind of pushing back against this bloated culture, you know, and then the printing press and solo scriptura, there there was this kind of like, we don't need all this stuff anymore. We just need the Bible. Yeah, right. And uh, that's fine. But I, I, I think why, even though maybe the cathedrals aren't really filled with people who are worshipped there, I used to live in France and I live by a cathedral. Um, they're open all day long and thousands, if not millions of people go there. Why? Because... Um, they used to build spaces to be a teacher. Now we just build spaces for a teacher. Yeah. And so when you take the teacher out, it's just a room. It's just a room. Right, right. Um, but when you think of the space as actually part of the spiritual formation, how you lay out your chairs. If you just have like a big stage in front and everybody in back, I used to be a teacher, that premise is like the, the person at the front has all the information and everybody's here to receive that information. But if you set up your classroom in like small groups and the teacher moves mm -hmm. around the classroom, that says the students hold the information. You're the facilitator to help bring that to the surface. Mm -hmm. what, what's, what's more of a model of discipleship? You know what I'm right, saying? Right, right. So our spaces matter. And I think we're, you know, we're, we're getting there and doing that. But um, I've grown up in Protestantism feeling like a <laughs> black sheep. Um, and, and have had a great privilege in working with communities to That's kind good. of think of spaces as, as formation. Yeah. So. I, I would invite individual pastors to the, the, to the discipline of like, don't, don't worry too much, especially if it's, a, if it's, if, how should I say this? If you feel like you're more stuck in a rut or on any long, like if you're feeling free about this question, then there's, that's one thing, but don't worry so much right now, like coming out of the gate, but like what to do with it, like how to use it in order to, in other words, like, cause the question was kind of like, how do we use, how, you know, like how, how does creativity help us? And I, I wonder if for a good season, one of the spiritual distance, disciplines, we can come all the way back to the beginning, a spiritual practice for full-time vocational people in ministry is like give yourself over to engage in creative works that you don't have any expertise or knowledge in. Mm -hmm. Go study, go yeah. learn something, go put yourself in a position to, to be informed and shaped and moved by something that you don't know how to make. You don't know. And you don't know what to do with. Um, Cause that's how the gospel came in your life to begin with. <laughs> Is you didn't, <laughs> like, you didn't know what was going on. You didn't know which side was up and right. you were formed. And one of the, one of the great, thing one of the great gifts that creativity that art offers us is to put us back in a position pretty regularly in which these words are rearranged in a way it's part of what we do the prayer book with words it's definitely what scott's doing with imagery but it's what like you know padre tuama does with his poetry or gregory Orr, or it's what mary oliver was doing with her poetry is uh rearranging words that we normally use in a way that disorients us a little bit so that we have to find ourselves placed in a position of listening and a posture of uh, receptivity. Mm. That's that good. might That's be good, a yeah. really powerful discipline for a lot of pastors who are used to taking information, what we, we know, content, figuring out a way to delve it out and delving it out as efficiently, as quickly or as effectively as possible. That's fine. But over the long run, we need more. Uh, and we and we need to recognize that the content, this is what some Scott and I go after in the book, the content is not the stuff you're passing on. The content is the ever ongoing relationship between you and God that's happening in your heart and your mind and your soul. Mm -hmm. So can mm -hmm. you put yourself back in a position to hear again, yeah, yeah, to listen yeah. again, and to not know what you're supposed to do with it? But that might be a way in which it, the creativity and art is maybe the best gift for a lot of pastors in this moment is – 
don't don't figure out knowing what to do with it right now. Just go get in. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I, I love because bo- both of uh, something that that both of you said has to do with response. You know what I mean? Which I think is huge. You know, it's like how are we responding to something? Like if we're if we're digging into creativity and it's something that we're learning and growing in, you know, some sort of creative expression, then you know we're responding to that in some way as we're finding our way. And then and that's one of the things that I really loved about your book was that. It wasn't a book about prayer, like how to have a better prayer life. It was a yeah. book that was inviting, um, you know, it was inviting like something out of me as I read it. It was inviting a response yeah. out of me. You know, you can't read it without responding. So that, I, I thought that was absolutely beautiful. So thank you so much, Justin and Scott, for being with us. Thank you for creating this this uh, beautiful, inviting resource um, to encourage people as they're seeking God. Um, again, it's entitled "Prayer: Forty Days of Practice," and if you're listening in today, we'll have we'll have uh, links in our show notes to the book itself. Um, guys, Justin and Scott, how can people learn more about your ministries or connect with you? You know, if they wanted to connect with you. So, Scott, how about you first? Uh, yeah, my website is scotterickson.art.com, but I am Scott the Painter on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, mostly on Instagram. Okay. Um, so those are the great places to connect with me and see my work and see what I'm doing. Awesome. Justin? JustinMcRoberts.com is the is kind of the hub for most things. And if you just search my name on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, I hang out there quite a bit as well. 40 Days uh, Prayer Book is where the book is found. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much for being with us. Certainly appreciate your insight. I uh, really enjoyed the conversation, guys. You Thanks, got Justin. it, man. Happy to be here. I appreciate you taking the time to be with us on this week's episode. Every week as we are putting the episodes together, we're thinking of you, our pastors and ministry leaders, and striving to provide insightful and inspiring interviews as you seek to grow as a kingdom leader. So we hope you're finding value from the Church Leaders Podcast. And if so, we'd certainly appreciate you taking a few moments to head over to iTunes and leave us a review. Your positive reviews and ratings help other church leaders more easily find our podcasts so they too can benefit from these interviews. Again, we thank you in advance, and if you have any comments, any questions, suggestions, or ideas for guests, I would love to hear from you. You can send me an email to podcast at churchleaders.com, or you can connect with me on Twitter. Finally, you can find this podcast as well as other great faith-based podcasts on the Faith Play app. It's available for both Apple and Android, and so we encourage you to check that out as well. So until next time, this is Jason Day encouraging you to love well, and lead well. You've been listening to the Church Leaders Podcast. For articles, videos, and free resources that will help you lead better every day, visit our website at churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.